It took until 1969 for humans to travel to the moon to find out that it wasn't in fact made of cheese, but is actually composed of other compounds such as silica. Now, we've never been to the sun, but we're pretty sure that we know what it's made of. Does that not strike you as a little odd? I mean, we have so many complex devices to measure the composition of objects nowadays, but how can we be so sure that we know what the sun is made of without ever testing a sample of it? In this video, I'll be explaining how we know this and why it matters so much. Let's start off with asking what our sun is. Our sun is a star and is one of the many hundreds of billions of colossal fireballs that you can find in our galaxy alone. What makes the sun so special is that it is our closest star, and so we orbit this star in a regular yearly cycle. The sun provides the energy that life here on Earth needs to thrive, and without it we would not be here, so it's pretty important. So important, in fact, that scientists have been studying it for centuries, because we can take what we know about the sun and then apply it to the rest of the stars in the universe. One of the most important questions about the sun is where does it get its energy from? And this can be answered by first finding out what it's physically made of. This is, however, where the problems start. As I mentioned at the beginning of this video, we had to travel to the moon to find out what it is made of. But if we did that for the sun, we'd run into a few issues. First of all, the surface of the sun is pretty hot, five and a half thousand degrees hot, in fact, which means that your rocket would melt before you even got there. Secondly, it's pretty big, so the gravity on the Sun is almost 30 times the strength of the gravity here on Earth. That means you'd either be crushed when you arrived, or you wouldn't have enough fuel to take off to get back home again. And finally, the Sun is quite far away. It takes light travelling at nearly 700 million miles an hour, just 8 minutes to travel from the Sun to Earth. Based on the current technology, it could take over 100 days just to get there to be reduced to a puddle of molten metal, of course. So, going to the sun is not an option. However, scientists being clever in that have found better ways of measuring what the sun is made of. To understand this, though, we need to journey back to 1802, where an English chemist by the name of William Hyde Wollaston was investigating absorption spectra. Emission spectra are something that I've already covered in another video, but the effect that we are interested in is the production of absorption spectra, which is the same sort of thing, but in reverse. Spectroscopy is essentially the study of that rainbow of colours you get from white light, like when you pass light through a prism, or even just seeing a rainbow. Now, emission spectra are formed due to the atoms that make up matter. You can think of the atom being made of a positively charged centre and being surrounded by negatively charged particles, known as electrons. These electrons can occupy various energy levels around the nucleus, with the lowest energy levels being closest to the nucleus. If we consider hydrogen, which only has one electron, it is said to be most stable and in its ground state when the electron is in the lowest energy level. If we give this atom energy, say, by heating it, this electron can have sufficient energy to jump up to the next energy level. However, this is not stable, so the electron can spontaneously fall back down to the lowest energy level. Since the electron has lost energy, and energy is always conserved, it releases energy in the form of a particle of light, called a photon. The important thing to note about these energy levels is that they are discrete, so all of the photons released for a particular transition will have the same energy. But what do we mean by saying that they are discrete? Well, it's like saying that stones are a form of energy currency. If the electron is in the third energy level, then it has three stones of energy. But it's not possible for it to have two and a half stones of energy, as the electron has to occupy one of the discrete energy levels. Discrete quantities are things that you can classify into groups, like dogs or cats, it's either a dog or it's a cat, or like saying things you can count. So I would never say that I have 14 and a half friends, it doesn't make any sense. I'd be more likely to say that I have... This basically means that you'll only ever find the electron in one of these energy levels, and so can't have half a stone of energy. Since energy is proportional to the frequency of the light, and the frequency of the light determines its colour, you will get one colour of light produced, since the energies of the photons are always the same. If we show this on the visible spectrum, 
we will get a bright line in one position, and the rest of the spectrum will appear dark. This is called a line emission spectrum, and in reality it's more complicated than this due to the multiple energy levels that the electron can jump from, so you would get more lines. However, the point is that atoms have their own characteristic emission spectra due to their unique energy levels, and so you can determine what element is being heated just by observing the colours that it emits. For instance, you may have done flame tests in chemistry, and this is the same sort of idea, with sodium having a characteristic yellow flame, barium being green, and calcium being brick red, so you can have a good idea of what the element is just because of its colour. If we use this and look at the sun through a prism, it will split the white light into a spectrum of colours. However, what Wollaston found was that not all of the spectrum was filled, there were gaps in it. It took many years of research by others to find out that the gaps were not in fact the separation between the colours, but were actually due to the composition of the sun. If we view the light from the sun, this light must have passed through layers of the sun's atmosphere to reach us. If there are atoms in this atmosphere which can be excited to produce a certain colour of light, then they can also absorb that particular colour of light to excite the electron. This means that when you view the spectrum of light from the sun, there will be gaps where those particular frequencies of light were absorbed by atoms in the atmosphere, and so this works exactly like the emission spectra, but in reverse. This is also similar to an effect I explored in another video on how we perceive colour. If we compare the pattern of the emission spectrum of an element to the pattern of the absorption spectrum of the sun, we can determine whether that element is present in the sun just by seeing if the two patterns match. It was Cecilia Payne Kaposchkin who was writing her thesis in 1925 about this effect, and concluded that since the highest contributors to these lines were the elements hydrogen and helium, the sun must therefore be made up primarily of these two elements. This is really exciting science, as the ability to determine the composition of substances just by viewing the light from them is so useful in physics and astronomy, and has led to many more discoveries about how our universe works. I find it amazing that us humans can learn so much about the universe from phenomena that we first discover on Earth, as we not only have been able to conclude that the sun is made up of hydrogen and helium, but also apply this to the rest of the universe, and conclude that main sequence stars scattered across the galaxy are mainly made up of hydrogen and helium. Thank you for watching, and if you enjoyed this, then you may enjoy a look at some of the other content I've made on space, astronomy and astrophysics. Click here for just that.